2016 has been a great year for university research projects that not only engage with the public through the fieldwork that helps deliver them, but also makes a tangible difference to the lives of real people up and down the country. In the second of the biannual Engage Awards organised and run by the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement, 18 varied, inspiring and significant projects spanning six categories were nominated at the NCCPE's two-day public engagement conference in Bristol. The Engage conference looked at how higher education can continue to work with external partners to deliver successful research. And the nominees discovered at the award ceremony held on the first evening whether their project had won. The winning project in the Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences category was Around the Toilet, a project looking at the future of the humble public loo. The research was carried out by Sheffield Hallam University and the judges said of it, this project took something seemingly mundane, the toilet, and used it to leverage profound change in how people think about and design toilets. A remarkable project led by a researcher in the early stages of her career, weaving the very best of the arts, humanities and social science disciplines. I caught up with the project lead, Dr Jenny Slater, after the award ceremony and started by asking her to explain the project in a bit more detail. Well, my background's in disability studies and I organise a lot of events and try and make those events as accessible as possible. Um, I kind of work at the intersection of like disability with gender and sexuality so a lot of conversations are kind of questioning kind of binary genders questioning understandings of what disability is and isn't so part of organizing an accessible event is thinking about how to make those toilets accessible now what we found is when uh, trans and queer people who perhaps didn't fit into other people didn't understand them as or they don't identify themselves in a gender binary came to those events they end up using the accessible or the disabled toilet because it's the only genderless space. Now, that, for some disabled people, caused a problem because that space is often quite, um, has quite a lot of pressure on it because there isn't many of those toilets. So we started thinking, okay, what happens? It's often kind of positioned this as an argument, like trans people are using a space that doesn't belong to them. Yep. And it's often positioned as these two groups that are quite oppositionary to each other. So we thought, okay, what happens if we get trans, queer, disabled people together and have conversations about what an accessible title would look like? And that's where it started. Okay. Well, that, that makes so much sense, though, doesn't it? Because you know, I think about some of my friends, or one of my friends who uh, is a guy, doesn't think of himself as a guy, and doesn't really want to use a male toilet, actually. But, you know, he's in that difficult space. And... Mm. Um, I think the, the tagline that I used when I was sort of writing the press releases and so on was um, you know, that peeing has become political, and it has, hasn't it? Yeah, I think peeing is political. I mean, the closure of public toilets is something that affects everybody, and people in our project... Oh, mind your back. It's all right. We can edit it. Yeah, I've been edit. promised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people in our project have talked about not leaving the house because there's no toilets to go to losing jobs, older people have talked about how um, the public library is the only place with a public toilet, so as public libraries are getting shut down, there's the cuts to public services generally um, including public toilets but also public amenities, it means the closure of public spaces I mean that people just aren't getting out leaving the house um, and it's also political about if there are toilets there, who those toilets, who's able to use those toilets, who those toilets represent so if I don't identify as a man or a woman neither of those toilets are made for me so I don't feel like I belong in that space if a disabled person's going in somewhere and needs an accessible toilet and there isn't one there again it's that well this this space wasn't built for me you're not expecting me as a customer as a citizen in this particular space uh, it's interesting you use the word customer because we are though aren't we we're customers when we're using public spaces um, well, increasingly, there's a, one of the things we've always been questioning is what is a public toilet, what is a public space? More and more, the spaces you go to the toilet, which are, are kind of these kind of semi-public spaces, so it might be that you nip into Starbucks, or it might be that you nip into a pub, but that's about you feeling that you're able to do that, so you feel, actually, I've got a right to go here. Um, we spoke to a Muslim disabled woman who said, I just can't go into a pub because people don't expect me to be in a pub. So she didn't have particular... Her particular religious convictions didn't mean she didn't want to be around alcohol particularly, but she just thought that she would be looked at weirdly. So she didn't feel have the confidence to go into a pub. If you've got kids, it would be the same thing. So, yeah, these, these public-private distinctions really 
complex and messy, I guess. Um, and increasingly, you have to be a customer to be able to use the toilet. Well, exactly. And yeah, and you didn't. We've talked a lot about gender mm. uh, identity, but. You talked to all sorts of different people, didn't you? You and your team, you talked to lorry drivers, you talked to people from different religions, you, you know, the, the world and his wife. It must have been a bit like an onion. Every time you took away a layer, another layer presented itself. Yeah, well, yeah, we started off with queer, trans and disabled people and so much more than that came up. School toilets came up, so we started talking to kids um, about school toilets. Labour, who cleans the toilet, and again, that's a gender, that's a class, that's a racialised issue because it's often... I mean, women, women of colour, yeah. poor women of colour that are yeah. cleaning those toilets. We got contacted by someone called Gillian Kemp, who's be- become really involved, and she runs this organisation called Truckers Toilets UK, and she's thinking predominantly about lorry drivers, but especially women lorry drivers, and where they go to the toilet. So we interviewed a woman lorry driver, which I had no idea that was going to come up at the beginning of the project. It wasn't something that was in my um, frame of reference, I suppose. But it was really interesting to talk to her. And I, I think the thing is that we've found is that everyone's got a toilet story everyone's got something to say um, I was just trying to a guy out there who was like yeah I, I, I'm a bloke I've got a kid I've got a baby and there's I can never find anywhere to change the baby it's expected that I have a female partner who's going to go into the women's toilets and do that change and so what does that say about the feminization of care um, so, yeah it's fascinating we start with toilets and we get bigger and wider constantly so so what what what's happening with the project now because if, if it is an onion you know, you're just going to keep yeah. up peeling away yeah. things that you're gonna, going to want to investigate, aren't you? Well, that's how it feels. We're, we've got a funding bid in. We're hoping to work more with architecture students. Yeah. We've kind of tried to engage with architects throughout the project, um, which has taught us about a lot about the kind of systemic structural constraints architects are working under. So the bottom line is they want to get something done as cheaply as possible. So we've started going in and talking to students at master's level and catching people in training and thinking about having a, starting a dialogue with them. So we're Do they engage with that? Are they interested? Yeah, I think, well, so I think we struggle to engage with architects working in practice and I think there are probably several reasons for that. So one, toilets, that seems important. It's often given to the lowest paid person. One toilets are seen as something that's kind of a bit trivial and doesn't really matter, haven't been thought about before it's not something that's often talked about in training Um, but also they're often like under big kind of financial trying to meet targets, lots of constraints and things, so what we did was we developed a continuing professional development lunchtime session and went to them, and when people have time they're up for the conversation, they're up for chatting about it, but it's that people don't feel they have time or don't feel it's that important which is why we've gone with the students to kind of catch people and have those conversations in training. So we're hoping to work more with architect students, hope to do more work in schools. And also, to like the project's come a lot out of our being a... So Disability Arts kind of goes to this idea that accessibility isn't a box-ticking process. It can be really creative. Yeah. So we're trying to draw on disability arts and queer arts to um, take that to architects. So, OK, this isn't something that's just like a pain in the ass. Bum. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is something that actually can be really creative and you can use your kind of creative artistic skills to think about accessibility and let's think about accessibility as something that's really exciting because we're excited by it. <laughs> Did you think you would be? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought I'd be. Like, yeah, it's what I'm interested in, so yeah. yeah. I've got a, a, I used to work with a, a, a woman who's an event organiser and um, lovely, <coughs> brilliant at her job. And I organised, I had known nothing about event organisation at all. Event management is beyond me. Yeah. But I was tasked with organising this event. And she said, it's really easy, Mark. Uh, organising an event, it's all about the number of bogs. Yeah. That's it. That's what it comes down yeah. to. But it's not, is it? It's all about, it's not just about the number of them. It's about how you designate yeah. them as well. So our outside events, has that been part of your remit yet? Um, yeah, accessible. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So an uh, organisation been working with Accessible Derbyshire do a lot of work around changing places' toilets and their toilets with like an adult-sized changer bed and a hoist. Right. And they actually are based in quite a rural setting. So talk about the issues particular to rurality. Is that a word? Being in a rural area, not. being in a rural place. Um, but we often are, we are also, mind you back again, 
we are also often working in spaces that we wouldn't have designed in that way. So it's like, what can we do with the toilets we've got in this space? So we end up relabeling toilets a lot of the time, which can kind of work for some of the issues, but not others. So it doesn't mean we've got a hoist and a changing bed, but it does mean we can perhaps re-gender or de-gender uh, gender neutralize those toilet spaces so and we've tried nothing's perfect that we've ever done and we've tried a few things but some of it is like toilets with urinals toilets you right without urinals so you're telling people what's in there rather than what they're kind of what we expect of them as a person or as an identity so they're not just ladies and gents so they're not just ladies and gents and it's you know people have come back to us and said yeah but what you've done there is you've taken away gendered categories so woman man and you've instead put like sex categories based on bodies so you're, so you're saying, OK, so that's for someone with a penis and that's for someone without a penis, basically. Um, so nothing's ever, be, nothing's ever felt perfect. Is it, is it that simple, though? Isn't it actually whether or not you've got a penis is whether that's the way you want to use the toilet, surely, isn't it? I think there's complex things going on around kind of cultural issues about whether people stand up or sit down. I think there's ideas of masculinity associated to it. In Emily would be able to help me out the date here, a guy called Alexandra Kira suggested in the 1960s that um, there should be more female urinals. Um, we'd probably question, either be, question them being called female urinals, but more urinals that were pr- predominantly di- designed for women and that never caught on. So there's something there about kind of how public your body should be in front of other people that are associated with those ideas of gender as well. And we've had fascinating conversations about the different etiquette of men's and women's toilets, about whether you, women's toilets is a social space, men's toilets is a space where you don't chat to each other, you don't look at each other. No, God, no, you don't do that. Because no. you, don't, you don't want people to think you're gay, basically, and that's where that comes from, is that if you look at another man's penis, then someone might think of you in a certain way. So there's lots of things that actually... Little boys are taught at school, are taught before Looks school where to look yeah. and where not to look. So it's fascinating. Yeah. Can I just chip in one thing? Yes. Um, one thing I was going to say. Don't step away from the microphone there. <laughs> so the toilet is this very mundane, everyday space, you know? A space that people either don't particularly want to talk about or laugh, um, but don't take it seriously. But I think one thing Jen was drawing on there is that we had conversations where people became self reflexive or reflected on ideas of body, of gestures of you know who looks at who this idea of what happens within small spaces that are also a kind of liminal space in between the public and private and those conversations were in and of themselves fascinating weren't they whether they were about the toilet or not how publics um, interact within small spaces is fascinating we think well, I think it is. I think it's a fascinating project. It, I found it fascinating. I didn't, you know, I've done nowhere near the amount of work you've done on it, but it, you know, just a little bit I've done it. Made me think about the whole subject in a completely different way. Not that I ever thought I would. Um, so I'll leave the last word to you, Jen. Um, what does Toilet Utopia, in terms of your research, look like? Oh, my God. You're asking a difficult question, isn't it? What, what do, if, if you could achieve one thing. Well, so one of the things that we have basically kept coming up is that there's a need for larger, more um, gender-neutral spaces for a whole variety of reasons. And that goes beyond just trans people's and disabled people's access. It's about people needing a space to get changed. It's about people in a private space. It's about people who have a parent of a, uh, a child or a caring responsibility of someone of a different gender. So I suppose... For us, that kind of... I don't know if it would be utopian toilet. I think that's difficult to think of outside of, like, starting to think about capitalism in relation to the (laughs) toilet, etc. But one of the things that participants continually said is let's not put let's not put signs in the doors that are about who should use those toilets but actually about what's in there and let's make bigger more gender neutral toilets 